For the past two Sabbaths, as I said, we've been studying the mark of the beast. And um, so here is what we learned briefly. I'm going to review. The first point two weeks ago was in Revelation 13, 16 and 17. The Bible says he, the second beast, which is the devil, when he's, he comes and he is going to personate deity. In other words, almighty God is going to pretend to be God to try to deceive as many as possible. The Bible calls this the greatest delusion. It will be a terrible time for, you know, when he does that. And so he is going to force everyone, small and great, rich and poor, and slave to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark and then the Bible describes what the mark is, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. In other words, when he comes, uh, the devil will take, let's just say for example, uh, Jehovah God or Jesus Son of God. We don't know what the name he's going to take. He'll take that name and then he appears as deity and he's going to say, anybody who wants to join my kingdom for a thousand years of peace on this earth will take my name and receive a literal mark with his name on it or his number. And at that point you can only imagine, you know, after having worked all kinds of miracles, you know, signs and wonders, even making fire to come down from heaven to the earth in the full sight of man to prove that he is God, then he's going to lead people to receive this karagma, this mark which is an in, is in print on the skin. It's, a, it's kind of like an engraving, as in a tombstone. Um, so, as I said, the word mark is karagma, which literally means a stamp or an imprinting, a scratch or etching, as an engraving, a tombstone. Welcome. And uh, so, so the mark of the beast will be imprinted and uh, on literal right hands, or literal foreheads. Okay? Now, here's the big question. Um, and because uh, traditionally, um, some people have understood that this mark to, have, to be Sunday worship. And I'm making the case that the Bible defines the symbol. The mark which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. So the question we need to ask is this. Since God has so clearly let us know and communicated to us in His Word that the mark of the beast will be the literal name of the beast or the literal, literal imprinted or tattooed on literal, literal right hands and literal foreheads, can any man or institution redefine what God in His Word has already so clearly defined? Are you following this? If the Bible says the mark of the beast, which is the name of the beast. See, the Bible, God is telling us what the mark is. So there is no speculation because the Bible is telling us. Okay? When God has so clearly defined that mark, He did that so there is no room for speculation. Okay? Um, so can any man or institution or redefine what God in His Word has so clearly already defined? And can any, any person make symbolic what God has made literal? They could try, but it's not going to cut it because God already defined it. And I spent about 40 minutes speaking about the need of rules you know, how rule number three, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> apocalyptic language could be literal, symbolic, or analogous. And when God gives a symbol, God has to define it. Because if God doesn't define it, who has the power to define it? Then everyone would have, would be entitled to their own opinion. Alright? So we are, you know, seeking truth is very, t it's difficult. Because we must allow the Bible to speak and not our preconceived ideas. And sometimes it hurts. <laughs> but we're going to see more about this. And I'm going to be addressing the which is later. Opposed to the King James. Alright. So okay, that was brought up last week. 
So, all right, so <clears throat> the answer is either the Bible speaks for itself or it does not. Because if the Bible doesn't, then who can speak for it, right? All right, so we also learned that at the sixth trumpet, because we're trying to put all these things together, and the sixth trumpet, when you look at the chart, it's exactly right at the same time. It aligns with the mark of the beast. At the sixth trumpet. Now, this right here, if you have never heard this before, please go and study, uh, study number seven on our website, www.secondcomingcc.org, um, and refer to study number seven, because you will understand that everything God does is for a reason. God does nothing out of anger or out of hatred, but everything He does is out of love. Amen? Um, the Bible says that during the, the Great Tribulation, okay, right before the Great Tribulation begins, and for logistic, logistical purposes, let's just say that the world population is 10 billion when that time comes. Right now we're like 7.4 billion or 7.5 or something like that. So, uh, to make it simple, the Bible says that when the <coughs> The time of trouble begins, 25% of the world population will be killed by the first four trumpets. Okay? Uh, Revelation 6, 7. Um, then, there's three-thirds remains alive. Right? Then the Bible says when the time of the sixth trumpet comes, the devil is allowed to kill one-third of mankind. So now, notice... This is a whole, 100%, 25% is a quarter. Now, three parts left, one-third of this, it's exactly another 2.5 billion. So half of the world population will be killed or died before the second coming. Okay? Now, why do I say this? This is very important because we, in order to understand the mark of the beast... And where, where, you know, where the sixth trumpet and the mark of the beast fits together, we need to understand this. Um, so, we also learn that the three phrases, the number of his name, the number of the beast, and it's, it, it is a man's number, means possession. It is a man's number. It is Mardoch's uh, car, for example. The car of Mardoch, Mardoch's car. That's possession. It belongs to me, right? The car belongs to me, or well, the, the bank, but pretend it's mine. <laughs> but so you get the idea here. So this is a man's name. In other words, the number of people belonging to the beast will be 666. Okay, and I'm going to explain this to you in a second. Um, so here's how it works. We learn that during the sixth trumpet, Satan will follow an ancient tradition that is visible in the Bible, several places in the Bible, and he will separate for logistical purposes uh, and to give rations to people, because that, that hunger, poverty, uh, death, and sickness, and wounds, people will be wounded, and, and it will be a very difficult time. So when he comes pretending to be God, he will use this ancient practice, very likely, to and separate people in groups of a thousand. Just like we see in the Bible, in several examples in the Bible. Um, and so after the groups have been established, okay, so after groups have been established, the devil will follow Moses' example and appoint one person from each group of a thousand to be its captain. Okay, so a thousand minus one, it's 999. Then, this leaves 999 people in each group. Then, the devil will then issue a death decree that will put everyone in shock. The devil will demand that the kingdom of God must be purified. Therefore, one-third, 333, of each group must be put to death. 999 minus 333 equals 666 of each group that will belong to the beast. Yes. Is this, is this all from the Bible, or where is this coming from? What, what is it? Where, where are you getting all this math from? Mm. Good question. All right. <clears throat> so, remember the, the, the Bible, the sixth trumpet, the, the devil is allowed to kill one-third? Mm -hmm. 
So one third, 999, just like Moses did, he elected one leader for each thousand. So you have 999 people left. So one third of that killed, one third of uh, 999 is 333. The remaining is 666. Oh, I meant, how, do you, how do you know it's going to be 1,000 to start with, is what I mean? Oh, okay. Well, let's just, because in the Bible, uh, this is an ancient practice that we see God used it several times in the Bible for wars. Every single time that we're dealing with uh, crowd uh, control uh, for war, uh, God always sent groups of thousands for battle. Um, so this is used, you know, to feed multitudes or to, like when jo uh, Moses was uh, killing himself pretty much with, with advising all the thousands of people, Jethro came and said to him, you're going to kill yourself, what are you doing? Separate the people in groups of a thousand so and help people help you. So, so this is a... Um, as I said, the mark of the beast will make perfect sense when the day comes. You see what I'm saying? So, if, this, if he does that, then he puts a captain, and that's 999. This leaves 999 people in each group. And the Bible, the Greek syntax, indicate possession. It's a man's number, a number of men that belongs to the beast. So, the first ones, the first 666 that receive the mark will be allowed to live, to live, and the rest will be killed. Okay? Um, you can also look at it as a whole, 100%, one third, always leaves three thirds. See what I'm saying? Uh, so you would be 0.66 or 66.66. So it would always be 666, uh, the number, whether you look at it separate or you look at it as a whole. Uh, three thirds. Minus uh, one third. Right. Yes. All right. Do you have the text? Uh, the text in the Bible. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I can give it to you. Yeah, I shared several of them last week. Uh, there are several, over ten verses that you can read about it. Yes, I shared a few of them last week. I can open the presentation and give it to you. And I wish I had the time to go over them. All right. So. Anyway, so the first six, six people willing to receive the karagma on the right hand will live. And those that receive on the foreheads are obviously for ranking purpose, to be identified as leaders. So the leaders will receive in the forehead so people would know who the leaders are of each group. Okay, But this is a brief review. We, we've covered this in more details uh, on presentation 30 and 31st uh, the last two weeks. So I just wanted to get you guys up to speed to where we are. And, um, but uh, this is the kind of thing that if a person is trying to make up, they couldn't. Because <laughs> it if it's not the Bible leading you there, you couldn't figure it out. All right. Now, so the sixth trumpet is directly connected with the mark of the beast, as you can see. All right. You can't, the, the one third, it's a very important number. All right, so summary, <clears throat> the mark of the beast will be a visible karagma or tattoo or engraving or printing, just like in Hitler's day. You know, Hitler used, during the World War II, Hitler tattooed his captives because tattoos are effective, simple, and easy to administer. And you can't forge it, you can't, it's not transferable, it's very simple. Uh, these are uh, upstanders during the Holocaust. KL means um, uh, concentration camps in German. German. So this is what happened in those days, and the Bible indicates that this will be the same case at the end of times. All right. Now I know some of you have questions, and we're going to have time to to uh, go over some questions at the end. And uh, but I want to um, before we get to that part, I want to talk to you a little bit about the necessity of rules, uh, because rules. Are not the way I treat the Bible. I don't treat the Bible as okay. This is what I need to find. Uh, this is what I think it is. So I'm going to try to find verses to prove my my idea. That's not how I treat the Bible. Uh, a rule leads you to the results. You see what I'm saying? Whether I try to make up the result, I have to follow those rules. And we went over this before. Um, but let me give you some examples here. <coughs> If you ask three men, 
how much is 2 plus 2? One man would say 3. One man say 5. And the other man says 4. If you knew nothing about math, you would think these three men are simply stating their opinions, right? But if you know something about math, you would know that one of them has the correct answer. So here's something interesting. The two men that do not know anything about math is making the one man that knows math looks pretty bad, isn't it? Because to the, to the observers, they're simply looking, they say, these people are just crazy. They're just giving their opinions. What makes your one opinion better than the other? And opinions are self-canceling. If I think yellow is better, you think blue is better? Who wins? <laughs> Nobody wins. Because they're self-canceling. Okay? So, because to the, uh, you know, so this... Um, so today, uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of definitions when it comes to Bible prophecy. If you ask a thousand pastors, they're going to give you 10,000 different interpretations. So what makes this better than everybody else out there? What makes this application correct and others not? You know, why, why am I so, um, why do I believe this so firmly? Okay, because of the use of rules. Rules leads you to understand the Bible. You know, it guides your understanding. I can tell you the rules before I can even open the Bible to you. And if we agree to the rules, you can actually figure this out yourself. You don't need somebody to tell you. Just like mathematics. If somebody asks, well, it's two times four, in ten different countries, you're all going to have the same answer. Because it's very simple and explanatory. Now, um, question. Why is there such confusion, though? People go to school for a thousand, I mean, for ten years to become a PhD in theology, and they, 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 you know, they know everything, they know the original language. Why is there such confusion? Why can a doctor agree to another doctor? Why is there such confusion in the world? Well, is the Lord the author of confusion? Look, notice what the Bible says, First Corinthians fourteen thirty-three: For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Okay? So why then is there such confusion in the world today in regards to prophecy? I believe there are more than one answer to this. But please consider this. The book of Daniel was sealed up until the time of the end. The Bible says in Daniel 12:4, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Okay, so, seal up the words of this prophecy an angel is telling him. And what's going to happen, even unto the time of the end. And then he says that at the end, notice the qualifications. Man shall run to and fro. That means to move quickly from one place to another. That's what the Hebrew, Aramaic or the Hebrew uh, means. To move quickly from one place to another. Do we do that nowadays? I mean, this was not, in, in, back in, in the 1800s, in the middle, people were moving to and fro in horses. <laughs> and it would take them months to get from one place to another. So knowledge had not increased dramatically the way it has now. In other words, the book could not have been open until then. Before I lose my thought here, let me ask you a question. What if, what if uh, God told you that this was going to happen? All the stuff that we read about the mark of the beast. And he says, you need to write this down and pen it in paper. And keep it for 2,000 years. So no one would understand until the 1,000 years. How would you write it? Yes. Yeah, how would you write it? I mean, there, there's not a whole lot of ways to write this. I mean, I think God is brilliant the way God gave these things to John. The way he wrote, you know, the one-third and the six-six. That's amazing. You know, how would you write it? Think about that. So, the point here is that the book was sealed up 
and it would become open at a time of the end when men would go to and fro. Why? Because knowledge would increase dramatically, an explosion of knowledge, not only knowledge pertaining to science, but also knowledge of the Bible. Amen? If you guys are too cold, we can turn the AC down a little. No, you guys? You're good? Okay, maybe... Listen. It is. So, yeah, just a little. So, so anyway, so this is the case over here. So the book of Daniel had to remain sealed up. I mean, think about the challenge that God has. He had to write these prophecies 2,000 years ago and keep it sealed up until the time of the end. I mean, think about that, the challenge. Because it would only be applicable to the last generation living at the time of the end. Alright? So, God has kept it sealed for 2,000 years and um, and God, I believe He has given us four simple elements or rules that unlock the prophecies of Daniel. A, a rule is not something that uh, a person makes up. You know the laws of gravity. You know every time you let this go, it's going to fall. That's a, there's no exception for that. That's, it's a, it's a self-evident. Every single time it works. That's what I mean by a rule. It's not something that a man fabricated. Okay, but we have talked about this in the past, and maybe one of these days we'll go over them again. But, um, all right. So, let's move on here. Can we trust Bible prophecy in the face where a thousand different pastors will tell you ten thousand different interpretations? Notice, 2 Peter 1.19, the Bible says, We have also a what? More sure word of prophecy, whereunto you do well that you take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So, this is pretty amazing because a sure word of prophecy, that's what God calls prophecy. You know, how could God call prophecy a more sure word of prophecy when no one can agree with it? <laughs> Every church seems to know more than another. How, would it, how could it be the more sure word of prophecy if anyone, no one is able to interpret it or agree upon it? Right? Well... What would be the point of giving prophecy at all if no one would understand it? What would be the what makes something uh, fake is the genuine, right? So, what makes a false prophet false is the fact that there's true prophets. What makes fake prophecies fake is the fact that there's true Bible interpretation. You get the point. God has a message. For the last day. Even Jesus Christ said, as of it was in the days of Noah, so Jesus says it will also be when Jesus Christ comes. In the days of Noah, only eight people believed, and the message wasn't pretty. Get on the boat, or you're all going to die. <laughs> Destruction is coming. The whole world is coming to an end. <laughs> people didn't like that very much, and they were talking down on him. Jesus says that that's what's going to happen during these days. Now, who is preaching destruction is coming upon the world? Do you know any church? <laughs> no. That's what Jesus means. So, but there is a group of people all over the place that have heard it, that have understood the rules, that are making the loud cry and preparing and letting people know of what is coming. The 144,000 are about to be sealed. The gospel will go through the whole world and Jesus Christ is coming. If you want to know how near we are, watch what is study number 27, 28, the imminent coming of Christ. Uh, we, we gave some very good thoughts how close we are from the second coming. All right. So, once again, be, uh, for 2,000 years, God has hidden four simple rules that unlock Bible prophecies because if there, no one were to follow rules, if rules were not followed, 
any person, any preacher, any person would be entitled to have their own opinion in the Bible. Okay? Now, rules produce the results. Okay? Can I have, please, a, a child up here as a volunteer for something I would like to... to uh, but you got to be able to answer some math. All right, come here, Eloise. <clears throat> Thank you. All right, so, yeah, turn. Uh, how I don't just stand right here? I need you to help me here, okay, honey? <clears throat> I want you to tell me. Uh, can you do this for us? What's the answer here? Two times five. Can you? Ten? Ten? You sure about that? Yes. See, I'm not happy with that answer. <clears throat> I'm not happy at all. He went against everything I know to be right. He really hurt my feelings. I see your point. Because I've always thought it was seven. <laughs> I've been told it was seven all my life. Okay, I need you to do me a favor. No. Can you come up with a different number? Because I don't like that at all. No. You have to. No. Why? Because that's the right one. Well, how do you know that? Two times five is ten. Well, no, can you make a seven, please? No. We need you to make a seven. Come no. on. <laughs> no. You get the point. Thank you, honey. Rules. <laughs> See? Rules produce the results. You cannot change it. You cannot fight it. You know, the fact that I can say, but, but wait a second, we can actually still believe this right here and, and incorporate with the old. You know, we don't have to discard it altogether. I wouldn't want to discard it, but it's not my calling. You see, the Bible leads us to that interpretation. I'm not the one making the whole thing up. When I studied the Bible, I only prayed, Lord, lead me to all truth. I don't care what the truth is. Just let me hear it. You see, uh, there is no agenda to defend. God does not need anyone to defend truth. Amen? Now, in regards to the new, new light, Jesus says this. Matthew 9, 16 and 17. No one patches an old garment with an unshrunk cloth. Do you guys know what unshrunk cloth is? I'm going to explain to you in a second. My grandma used to make those things, and my father too, but from cotton. These amazing machines they built. They can make clothes. That's amazing. Because the patch will pull away from the garment and makes the tear worse. See, when you're making clothes from cotton, the cotton is fresh, so... I don't know how they make it, but they make these threads, and then they put in this machine, and you make a beautiful piece of cloth, right? Well, if you have an old cloth that is already shrunk, because cotton, once it cures, it shrinks. Now it, you can wear it. It doesn't change. Now, if you have a tear, and you take an unshrunk piece of cloth, and you patch it, and then you sew, stitch it around, when that thing shrinks, it's going to make the hole even bigger, Okay? So that's what Jesus means. Um, so Jesus came, the point is that He came to bring new light. But the Bible says that men love darkness. That means their traditions, rather than light. Okay? They did not accept the light that Jesus came to bring because He went against the light they already had. Okay? Jesus also said, Jesus also said in Matthew 9, 17, and no one puts new wine into old wine skin. Otherwise the skins burst, the wine spills out, and the skins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wine skins, and both are preserved. In other words, I inserted some words here for clarification. And no one puts new wine, that's new truth, into old wine skin. That's a follower of tradition. He's speaking to the Pharisees. Otherwise, the skins burst out and the wine spills out. The new truth will not be retained. It will spill out. Okay? And the skins are ruined. A person who rejects truth is left empty. Ruined, so to speak. Because they're rejecting the spirit. And the skins are ruined. But they put new wine, or new truth, into fresh wine skin and both are preserved. You know, this right here. In other words, in order for new truth to be welcome, it must be presented to someone whose heart is fresh and open to the new truth that is being led by the Spirit. 
that is not trying to, to, uh, to defend a tradition or a belief, but is, Lord, I, wanna, I want you to, to tell me what truth is. Let me, see if you, let me see if line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Amen? Um, <clears throat> so essentially, Jesus is saying that presenting truth to a lover of religion is a waste of time. Uh, if a person is happy and satisfied with their religion, leave them alone. Don't bother them. Don't offend them. You know, um, and I'll show you a verse for this in a second. I was here uh, in the beginning, like eight, ten, ten months ago when we began with this ministry. And a lady came in around 3.30 and with her poor husband. And, and she got in and she was very angry. She got in a fight with someone in there because the door was getting stuck. And she came in here and she says, who are you? <laughs> I'm like, Marta Silva. She's like, what are you doing here? I'm like, I'm trying to get this camera set up here because we're having a Bible study. But what are you doing here? I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> okay, let's rewind a little bit. How can I help you? You know, can I help you? She goes, well, I'm here because, uh, uh, are you with the conference? I'm like, no, no. She says, who pays you? I said, this is a self-supported ministry. No one pays me. She goes, um, well, uh, I said, I don't understand, okay? And her husband was outside already. He was so embarrassed. <laughs> Poor Henry. I'll let, I'll call him out. I don't care. And what happens is, they, they came in and she was so mean. And, um, and I said, well, I don't understand. What is it that you want from me? I don't understand. We're not communicating here. She goes, well, I was told that you're starting the, 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 the Seventh-day Adventist church back from the 1800s. And you're going to preach from Ellen White and this and all this stuff. And I said, okay, okay. I said, you've been given the wrong information. I said, I'm nothing against uh, Ellen White. I said, but our ministry is, is focused on the Bible and the Bible alone. I said, this is, you've been given the wrong information. I said, listen, I'll be very honest to you. You're very welcome to stay. Uh, but I believe you're going to be miserable here. <laughs> I, I, I told her that. She goes, thank you so much for telling me. And she never saw her again. <laughs> she walked out. <laughs> well, the point is, she is trying to retain to a religion and that she thinks is already fallen because she's not happy. If I had anything to do with the conference, it wouldn't work for her. But she wants to, to rebuild something. And I said, no, that's not what we're doing. We're just simply studying the Bible. If you like the Bible, please stay. If you don't, then there's no place for you. Um, you know, that's what Jesus meant by, um, do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you in pieces. Okay? When you give truth to somebody, they're not going to like it. If they're lovers of tradition, they're going to tear you in pieces and they're going to tramp upon the truth like it's garbage because it's not valuable to them because they have a treasure already that they found. They're happy with their tradition. Okay? And, and then they're going to go around tearing you and, and assassinating your character with gossip and prejudice. Okay? But anyways, um, I mean, um, every single time God has revealed new Bible truth. It was always met with opposition. But despite of the opposition, shall we remain quiet? I mean, imagine if Martin Luther would have remained quiet. Everyone would still think like Catholics. Imagine if uh, Ellen White would have remained quiet. We would all think like Methodists. You see the point? We need to speak. When God gives, if somebody doesn't speak because they're too scared of their security or whatever, God will raise somebody else to speak. It doesn't matter. But truth will always go forward. Amen. Amen? Amen? So the point is that we need to speak the truth. Whether it's happy, people are happy or not. Whether it's popular, whether it's not popular. It makes no difference. Truth is truth whether you, somebody believes or not. Amen? Alright. So, so today I, I want to address those two questions that were brought up last week. Uh, valid questions about the mark of the beast. So, 
Uh, let's look at these questions. All right, so the first question or argument has to do with Revelation 13, 16, because I use the NIV version, okay? And uh, so he, the second beast, that is Lucifer personating as deity, also forced everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on his right hand or on his forehead, so that no one could buy or sell unless he had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name. So there are two arguments. The, the first, the words which is, the a person came up and says the words which is is not on the original. And the reason why this was brought up is because in the King James, the word which is is not there. So it must not be on the original, right? If it's not in the King James, God forbid, right? Okay, well, and uh, so notice what the King James says. Revelation 13, 17. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Okay, we'll come back to this in a little bit. The second argument was the NIV was translated by the Catholic Church and Catholic Jesuits before, uh, therefore, the change. Because the, the, the Jesuits had an agenda to hide the identity of the Pope. So they, they translate it. All right? so, uh, so let's start with this second argument first. Was the NIV really translated by Jesuits and the Catholic Church? Let's look at some facts. New International Version History. The New International Version was conceived in 1965 when after several years of study by committees from the Christian Reformed Church and the National Association of Evangelicals, a transdenominational an international group of scholars, 15 to be more precise, at Paulus Heights, Illinois, and agreed on the need for a new translation in contemporary English. Okay, here's another source. The, inter the new international version, NIV, was, a, uh, was produced by a committee of scholars associated with various evangelical churches in America who began work on the version in 1965. So as you can see, to the best of my knowledge, there are no concrete evidence that authenticates this claim at all. Okay, As you can see, there were several denominations. I'm sure there might have been a Catholic there too. But should we exclude them because they're Catholic? Should not let them participate? No. I mean, that makes no sense. Um, but for the sake of the argument, I'm going to play the devil's advocate here. Let's just say that in fact the NIV was translated by the Catholic Church and they changed it to, to hide the Pope's identity as a beast. Let's just say, for the sake of argument. And, um, <clears throat> um, and <clears throat> so, no, yeah, so what about all these dozens, all the other dozens of translations that use the same or similar words as the NIV? Notice. All these versions, and even more, says the same thing as the NIV says. Okay? I mean, I'm not going to read them to you, but are, did the Catholic Church translate all these too? No. I mean, if they did, they're very powerful. You know, because that's amazing. I mean, all these translations use similar words to the NIV. Okay, I'm going to explain in a second. So... This makes no sense. You know, if you really want to know the truth, this argument arose from catalophobia. Is this a new word to you? You know what catalophobia is? Yeah, you're, you're, it's like, you know, people, they, they just so anti-Catholics that, that they, everything, the Catholic Church is trying to do this because they're going to enforce Sunday, they're going to do this and that. And then these sentiments against Catholics come up. And then this kind of stuff, this kind of argument or rumors go forth. But there is no truth to this whatsoever. Okay. Um, all right. Now let's get back to Revelation 13, 17, the King James. And understand why the choice of words for the King James. Okay. So Revelation 13, 17, King James Version. And now maybe it's getting too hot. And <laughs> please, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, honey. Now, 
So, and now let's read it again. And no man might buy or sell, save he, the, the Greek reads, save he that is having the mark, or King James said had the mark, or Ada, the name of the beast, or Ada, the number of his name. Okay, Ada in Greek is pronounced Ada. It's a conjunction that puts two sentences together. Okay, instead of, uh, of saying, I like peanuts, Coma. I like peanut butter, I mean, or jelly. I can say I like peanut butter or jelly on my sandwich. It's a conjunction that puts two sentences together. Now, Ada is mostly translated or or either. That's the most common translations you find in even modern English, in modern Greek. Now, but it can also be rendered namely, that is, and which is. Those are appropriate as well. Ada. Okay? So, let's do this for a second. Um, and I'll, I'll give you guys a break in a little bit if, we, if we're getting to that part. So, so, notice here for a second. Stay with me for a second. So, so that any man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, either the name of the beast, or either the number of his name. Now let's use namely. And that no man may buy or sell save he that had the mark, namely the name of the beast, or, well you could use namely, or, or namely, it doesn't matter. You have to use the context, indicate what is the most appropriate word that you need to put in there. That's how translations work. So, namely the name of the beast, or the number of his name. And you could do that with that is. So that... <coughs> Save he that had the mark, that is, the name of the beast, <clears throat> or the number of his name. So it's very appropriate to use which is. It is very appropriate uh, <clears throat> to use either one of those five uh, examples I gave you. Okay? And that is why all those translations use either one or the other. But most commonly, if you probably look up in the dictionary, most commonly it's going to be or, or either. Okay? <clears throat> Alright, so... Okay, now, I'll do one more point here, then we'll take a break. <clears throat> now, let's suppose <clears throat> that a person says, I will only believe that the beast, the mark of the beast, it is truly the name of the beast, that say, the name that Satan will take, and not Sunday worship, if the King James Bible says so. <clears throat> let's say they insist and say, this is the only Bible I believe, and I know people like that, believe me. And I need to see it in the King James. If I don't see it in the King James, no deal. That's fine. If this is what it's going to take, I'm going to show you in the King James. Amen? All right. Let's look at it. Re uh, Revelation 14, 9 through 11. And the third angel, and then we'll do this, we'll take a break. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now watch this. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and who, whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. King James Bible. Holy King James Bible. I mean, it's so clear. The Bible defines it to us so that there is no need to speculate what the mark is. You know, if I, if I you know, when Gio was little, he, uh, you know, when we moved here, our house was a big mess, so I was doing the remodeling. And, um, and the, the shots uh, graciously allowed our family to stay there for, I think it was two or three weeks. And all the kids, and they gave us a beautiful room and a beautiful house to stay. I stayed in the mess trying to fix everything. Well, there was a little dog that they, little had, that they had, this tiny little thing, so cute. He was about 39 years old at the time. <laughs> and <laughs> his teeth looked like pretty black. And uh, I don't know what happened. Yeah, he, he got upset with Gio, and he bit him on the cheek, and he still has the, the little mark. You know, to this day. 
So every time I see the mark, I think of Mr. is the name of the dog. So I say, that's Mr.'s mark right there. <laughs> so, no, if I say that's Mr.'s mark, is, does, does that mean that a lion at the zoo did it? Can I say a lion? No. That is the mark of Mr., the little dog. I don't know what part of the mark of the beast. You don't understand. <laughs> Do I need, does the, what else would the Bible and God do to make you believe that it's not Sunday worship for crying out loud? All right, let's take our break. Amen. So welcome from break. I hope you had some good snacks. Um, so we've been talking about the mark of the beast and how God clearly defines what the mark of the beast is so we don't have to speculate and try to make symbolic what God has made literal. Now, you can search from Genesis to Revelation. You're not going to find one Bible verse saying that Sunday is the mark of the beast. Okay, now let's ask the tough question. So, since God has so clearly communicated in His Word that the mark of the beast will be literal, you know, the literal name of the beast, literal tattooed on literal right hands because of the name Karagma, and literal foreheads, can any man or institution de redefine what God in His Word has so already so clearly defined? Does any man or church has the power to make symbolic what God has made literal? Either the Bible speaks for itself or it does not. And if it doesn't, then who can speak for it? I keep repeating myself over and over. Because this is so important. You know, um, and I know, friends, that this will make a lot of people upset... Okay, But I want you to understand that I am not attacking the Seventh-day Adventist Church at all. I am simply defending truth against tradition. Okay, That's all that I'm trying to do, but I don't know any other gentle way to do it. So that's why you hear me saying, Adventists believe this, Adventists believe that. You know, It's because I, there, I don't know any other way to say it that would sound better. Okay, I mean, usually uh, in Ad Seventh Day Adventist seminars, I have heard them saying several times, uh, "We will give you a hundred thousand dollars for any person that can bring one Bible verse proving that Jesus changed the Sabbath to Sunday." You heard that? Well, I want to say to anyone that is watching this presentation, including all my pastor friends and anybody out there, I'm a lot more generous than than that. I'm offering a million dollars. To anyone who can give me one Bible verse that proves that Sunday sacredness or Sunday worship is the mark of the beast. You know why I can offer? Because it's not there. You can't prove it from the Bible alone. You cannot do it. Okay? Um, so, such verse does not exist. So, I am simply calling people to abandon tradition and to believe the Bible. All right? And it's a, tough, it's a tough call. It's a tough call. It hurts. Just like me and the little example here with Eloise. I didn't like the answer she gave me. But I'm trying to change it. But I don't like it. But I have to accept that it's 10. Because that's what the Bible says. All right? All right. So now, second argument. And we'll try to wrap it up so we can do the answers or the questions. The second argument was this, when, okay, I guess I meant to write the devil, when the devil, the devil physically appeared on the earth claiming to be deity, he is going to impose Sunday worship on the world. This is what it was an argument used to me last week. In other words, we don't have to throw away the old, we can just use that and it would be a perfect fit that the devil would actually, he is the one making Sunday into the whole world. Well, I already said that would be Sunday laws in, in Christian nations when the composite beast arises, trying to appease the wrath of God. There will be Sunday laws or sinless laws enforced all over Christian nations, just as much as there will be Friday laws enforced in Muslim nations and, and, and Sabbath laws in, in Jerusalem. You know, Israel, because they're trying to appease the wrath of an angry God the best way they know how. 
But this is not going to be a worldwide thing. And I'm going to show you why this is not consistent with the Bible. I'm going to show you this from the Bible. Okay? Um, the Bible does not teach that at all. It's, a, it's, a impo it's an impossibility. Okay? Uh, this would put the Bible in, in, in a state of internal conflict. And the Bible does not contradict itself. Okay? So, notice. <clears throat> Let's make some points. Second Thessalonians 2, 3, and 4. Paul here is writing. He says, Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. For that day, speaking of the second coming, will not come until the rebellion occurs. That will be a, re a rebellion. You know, when the 144,000 come, they preach the truth to the world. They hear the truth, but they reject the truth. And there's a massive rebellion. And Daniel 8 uh, portrays the same rebellion. Okay, So there's a rebellion right before the second coming. That's during the, when everybody... Except they denied the Holy Spirit. The, the clear evidence of the clearest evidence of truth ever presented to a human being through the mouths of the 144,000. Now, and it says, so this day will not come until the rebellion occurs first, and the man of, sin, of lawlessness is revealed. The man doomed to destruction. That's talking about Satan. Now he, Satan, will oppose and exalt himself above. Or over or against. That's what the word in Greek means. Everything, King James says, all that is called God. Because some, people, uh, some people's gods are things, right? And animals and living things. Uh, some are just simple idols like a table. So that's why it includes everything that is called God or is worshipped. Now, what is... He will oppose and exalt himself above all gods... And everything that is called God or worshipped. Now, what do people worship in this world? Like I said, you know, the Sikhs worship a cow. Uh, Christians worship Jesus. Muslims worship Allah. Uh, Buddhists worship Buddha or Dalai Lama, whatever. All gods. He's going to exalt himself and will not favor any other gods that is worshipped. Okay? He will not favor them, but he will be above all. All gods. Now, uh, even the gods, the Greek mythological gods and all the gods. Uh, amen? So, um, now, let, is, let me look at, let's look at this in different parts of the Bible. Daniel 8, 9. Out of one of them, one of them here is the four winds, the context. Speaking of the coming of the Antichrist again. Came another horn which started small but grew in power. Okay, Satan when he comes, he starts small because he's not going to be like Jesus that they can see him at one time. The whole world will see them one time. No, they, they start small. He goes to Jacksonville, then he goes to France, he goes to Brazil, he goes to Rio, then he goes to all these different places. It will take him 148 days to make a, a presentation before the whole world and to deceive the whole world. So, then he grew in power to the south and to the east and towards the beautiful land. That's the west, Jerusalem. So what direction is coming? The north. Yeah, he's the, that's why the Bible calls him the king of the north. So, um, now, verse 10. It, the horn, grew until it reached the host of heavens. And it threw some, the word some, of are, is supplied. Those two words are not in the original. Most translations drop them, but they try to make it easier for you to read, so they put those two words. So, it threw, this horn, threw the starry host down to the earth and trample on them. If you trample on something, you are what? Oh, above, right? Those things. Okay, so that's what he's going to do. It set itself up to be as great as the prince of the host. Just like Jesus. Okay? That's exactly what the devil is going to do at the end. We'll come back to this later. Um, so, let's find out briefly what these starry hosts are. What are these things? What are starry hosts? They throw, cast them down and they tramp upon the starry hosts. Okay, let's look, let the Bible answer. Jeremiah 19.13 
the houses in Jerusalem and those of the kings of Judah will be defiled like this place. Topath, all the houses where they burn incense on the roofs to all the starry hosts and pour out drink offerings to other gods. Okay, so starry hosts are gods that are worshipped. Here, another example. Uh, 2 Kings 23, 4 and 5. The king ordered Hilkiah, the, the high priest, the priest next in rank, and the doorkeeper to remove from the temple of the Lord all the articles made for Baal and Asherah and all the starry host. He burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the, of the Kindron, Kindron Valley, and he took the ashes to Bethel. He did away with a pagan priest appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense to the high places. That's they put their gods on the high mountains so they can be closer to God, so to speak. Of the towns of Judah and those around Jerusalem, those who burn incense to Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the constellations and to all the starry hosts. You have the idea what they are. The constellations, all the, you know, the planets and all those things that people worship. There are many more examples, but I'll give you one more. 2 Kings 17, 15, 16. They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their fathers and the warnings he had given them. They followed worthless idols, speaking of Israel, and they, them, and themselves, they themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do, and they did not and they did the things the Lord had forbidden them to do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols, cast into the shape of calves and the Asher pole. They bowed down to all the starry hosts and they worshiped Baal. So this horn, when he appears at the end, he is going to throw all the starry hosts down to the ground and trample upon them. That's exactly what 2 Thessalonians 2 says. Okay? Um, so all the, the sorry holes, all the various gods that mankind worship and religion. Alright? So let's, uh, um, let's look at this in one more place and make one more point. Speaking of Satan when he appears, the Bible says in Daniel 11.36, it says, The king, meaning of the north, because that's the direction he comes, will do as he pleases. He will exalt and magnify himself above every god. Have you heard that before? And will say unheard of things against the god of gods. Okay? And he will be successful unto the time of wrath is completed. For what has been determined must take place. Place. God allowed these things to happen, remember? God allowed the, the devil up here, you know, at the, the, for example, the sixth trumpet, at this very day, at this very hour, at this very month, at this very hour, the devil allowed these four demons to do this. And so everything with God, there's a time for everything. Okay, everything, there's a specific time that God allowed this. The, the Lord allowed him to appear the fifth trumpet and come out of the abyss and become visible. Not before, we cannot see the devil now. He doesn't have a body now. But at the fifth trumpet, he will. Okay, because the Lord will allow him. Alright. <clears throat> now, notice uh, verse 37. He, the king of the north, will show no regard for the, the, the word gods. Here is also supplied. It's better rendered God. It's Elohim. It could be translated God or gods. He will show no regard for the God of his father, okay, also supplied, which is the God of, the God of his father is who? Who is the father? Who is the creator of Lucifer? Jesus. So the God of his father is the father of all, okay? And so he will show no regard for God the father or for the one desired by women, okay? Since prophecy is concerning the Messiah, the Messiah's birth was so popular in, in Israel. Jesus Christ became the, 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 um, the Messiah became the male child that every virgin wished to have in Jerusalem. They all wanted to have. That's why he's Jesus desired of, you know, we sing that song. He's a desired of women because every woman wanted to be the mother of the child 
that is born from an immaculate conception. You know, this was already prophesied. So, so he will show no regard for God the Father or for Jesus, the desire of women, nor will he regard any God, all the ones I listed plus more, all the gods that we don't even know their names. He will show no regard for the cow of the Sikhs, for Allah of the Muslim, for the Jesus of the Christians. He doesn't care. He's going to set himself above them all. And, and then, you know, so uh, once again, he is going to exalt himself above them all. And he will oppose all of them. Okay? And let me ask you guys a question. Concerning the Antichrist's physical appearing, when Lucifer appears as, uh, as deity in, in, on earth, pretending to be God, would Satan oppose or honor the Muslim religion if he enforced Friday worship on the whole world? No. Not at all. Why? Because that's their holy day, right? So, so Satan would, if he, if he enforced, okay, every single person on earth must worship on Friday. Well, the Muslim would love that. How is that opposing the, the Allah? Not at all. You know where I'm going with this. Satan would oppose, or would he oppose or honor the Jewish religion if he enforced the Sabbath worship on the whole world? I would be jumping up and down, right? No problem. But he would not be honoring, he would be not be opposing the Jews. And of course, <clears throat> would Satan oppose or honor the Christian religion if he enforced Sunday worship on the whole world? You see, it does not add up with the Bible. He will not enforce Sunday worship on the world at all. Because he, be, he would be honoring the Christians because that's the day of Jesus' resurrection. They would take that gladly. They'll be like, yes, you're our body. Yes. Okay. But if we know there's truth and there's falsehood, yes. and we know that the Sabbath is God's holy day, yes. then when the devil does exalt himself, he will have his counterfeit, and he will be setting up the counterfeit. Uh -huh. Now, to set up the counterfeit, you may have a lot of Christian religions that are content with that. Yes. But it's still there's still significance in the value of the counterfeit. There's okay. no reason for us to have any significance and for God to talk about yes. the devil's going to change time, <clears throat> to change times and seasons. There's no, okay. there's no reason for any of that if there truly is not going to be a counter to the devil. Yes. Okay, well, thank you for that question uh, or that comment. Consider this. Since the Bible says that the core conflict, and that's a valid point, concerning... The, the, the core conflict during the Great con uh, Tribulation will be one of worship. Right? It's very clear in Revelation 13. And since the devil will not favor one religious system and alienate the others, as we read all over the Bible, to be consistent, he will oppose them all. In fact, when the devil establishes one world church state theocracy, he will eliminate all the religions of the world including their holy days. Therefore, Lucifer will have to establish a day for worship that does, not, that does not have anything in common with any existing holidays. For this reason, I believe Friday, Saturday, and Sundays will become ordinary days. And here is how this can be done. If a 10-day weekly cycle is enforced, God's holy 7-day Sabbath would mostly forward ordinary days. This would defy God's seven-day Sabbath and clearly exposes those who keep it. Okay? Egypt and China followed the ten days weeks for centuries. Also, France, um, from uh, 1793 to 1805, in trying to defy God and, and stop the influence of the Catholic Church, they tried these ten-week cycles in there. And several nations in the ancient times have done this before. And we were doing the math. Uh, my daughter, she's very good with numbers, Eloise. She was doing the math. I, think, uh, I believe like most, I think like seven, it takes like seven weeks to have one Sabbath falls on the seventh day. It usually falls on a Tuesday, on a Monday, on all different days. Um, so, only time will tell. I'm not saying that this is what it is. 
Okay, I don't, I'm not the final answer, but I'm just suggesting that based upon all the specifications the Bible has, has given, he will exalt himself above every religion, including their holidays. Okay, but only time will tell. Just okay. carrying on from what he tried in heaven, really, just to be the top Re dog. To be the top dog, that's right. Um, now, is it Lucifer who brings... Oh, oh, this is another point already. Getting ahead of myself. Yes, let me go back here. Well, I think your argument about, you know, we can't, there's not a verse in the Bible that you can pull. Yes. No, 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 no. I, 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 didn't, I didn't argue that. I said that that's what Adventists do in seminars. We yeah. challenge. There is no verse in the Bible. Right. That's right. And there's no verse in the Bible that shows that Satan will enforce Sunday. So that's you right. You can tell me that and I won't believe it because it's yes. in the Bible. That's right. So I'll, actually, I don't know, but if there's a day in the Bible, it's not the Sunday. Yes. It hasn't, it's not in there. Yes. So I was going to challenge if you were saying it. Mm -hmm. I was ready to challenge you now. Amen. Say, hey, if there's no verse in the Bible, show me a verse in the Bible that says Satan will enforce. Amen. Thank you so much. Yeah, you have to go through all the way. Yes. I would be glad to see the next slide. Thank you so much for that clarification. That's a very nice, valid point. Thank you so much. I'm glad. <laughs> yes. You got to think those things through because you got to allow the Bible to guide. Thank you so much. Yes, Darla. So, Yes. Come with new truth. Yes. What do you think the purpose of our church was? Okay, wonderful question. Wonderful question. Um, let. Okay, so the question is, I want to reiterate the question. Um, what is the purpose? Uh, what do I think the purpose of the Seventh Day Adventist Church is? Okay, God has always had a people on earth. God has used. Um, there was a time, believe it or not, that the only light bearing on earth was the Catholic Church. All the way from, you know, the first few centuries, all the way up to the 1600s. There were the light bearers. There was barely any light, but they were the only ones. Of course, there were the Waldensians, hidden, okay? And all the, all the other people that always fall to God. Then the Lord raised up uh, Martin Luther. Then, God, did God use Martin Luther mighty? But then somebody says, wait a second, the, ba the Bible says there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So a true baptism, we've got to shove people under the water completely. The word baptism means to submerge under water. So they say, oh, well, we need to start, uh, uh, we need to let you guys know that this is not okay to sprinkle. And then they said, no, 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 there's no more room here because Luther did not believe this. There's no room for more light. So they had to start a church called the Baptist because there's more Light had to emerge, and people don't do well with light, more light. So they start a church called the Baptist. Well, God used the Lutheran mightily, okay? Then God used the Baptist mightily. And then there came the seven-day Baptist. Wow, the Sabbath was discovered. Oh, no, we don't believe that. We believe Sunday, the Baptist said. Okay, well, then we need to pardon and start the seven-day Baptist. Okay, well then that kept going on and God used them mightily. And then a, a group of people in the early 1800s says, Wow, there's so many truth in all these different people. Why don't we just put them all together? And God gave them the immortality of the soul and the investigative judgment. So God put that all together and he started a movement called the Seventh-day Adventist Church where he had the five essential doctrines in it, the only church on earth that has the five essential doctrines that enable us to actually understand the book of Revelation. Because if you read the, the sixth seal, the souls under the altar, and you don't know anything about the state of the dead, you'll be like, oh, the dead are all up there. You have no idea. So God had to put this thing together in such a marvelous way. So is, are the Baptists bad people? Is, does, does God still use the Baptists? Does God still use the Lutheran? Does God still use the Catholic? I believe He does. Okay? There's God's people in all those bodies. But God was through with them. And a new trustees were brought up. You know, there's a study on the trustees that we did. And then, then God used the, you know, the, the Seventh-day Adventist Church mightily. Raised up a, 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 
a humble lady, gave her even visions that were from God to put this church together because it was a terrible time during those days. Okay? And if she had not had the, the, the visions, it would have never come out of the ground because 300 people would show up if you read, the, if you read the, the history. 300 people would show up together to talk about doctrines. 300 people are ready to teach. Nobody wanted to listen. So, so God raised up this movement. Now, are, is, now, are they, now, what happens is this. Now, God is going to raise up the 144,000 to finish the work. Does God still use the Seventh-day Adventists? Yes. But are they going to finish the work? Just like the Baptists, just like the Seventh-day Baptists, just like the Lutherans, just like... No. Okay, does that make sense? So, <clears throat> do, do we, is it good to have a place to worship? Absolutely. But not to worship the church, but to worship God in the church. D big difference. Yes, sister. Can you speak it a little louder so I can get it on the mic? I want to say that even the name of the three angels, we are the church of the three angels message. We have, the Adventist church has labeled itself very well because there's a fourth angel. There's the last message. Yes. So the fourth, the, the church, the last church, the 144,000 and the millions of people that will decide to give their life to Christ. Uh, is the last church of the fourth angel. There's a fourth angel's message that our church didn't label itself with because it didn't see oh. it. So, oh. three angels message labels our church for its time, for its place. As that, that gradual understanding. But there's a fourth angel's message. And there's a the one that illuminates the glory of Revelation 18.1. So, we, unannounced to us, labeled ourselves properly. Three angels message. So far we knew, so far we knew, but not true. And now is the end. That's the fourth. Amen. Um, I'm going to show you one more uh, <clears throat> verse here, <clears throat> one more point uh, that I think is valid since we're talking about the sixth trumpet. And uh, I'm not going to get back to the sixth trumpet, but I want to make you the point that it is not Jesus who closes mercy, okay, or for Adventist probation. It is actually the devil himself that does it. Notice. Uh, so, Daniel 8, 10 to 12, speaking of the horn, Antichrist when he appears, it grew until he reached the host of the heavens, and it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself to be as great as the prince of the host. It took away the daily, the word sacrifice is inserted. Just translators try to make it easier for us to understand but it should be in service. The daily service from him, from the prince, from Jesus. And the place of his sanctuary was brought low because of the rebellion. Okay, this is Daniel 8. Remember the rebellion that Paul talked about? There's a rebellion that will occur before when they reject the 144,000. So because of the rebellion that billions of people deny and reject because they're, they're on self-preservation mode, when they hear the message of the 144,000, if, if they take heed to it, they're going to be persecuted if not killed. So they say, uh-uh, we love our lives. That's why Jesus says, those who try to save their lives will lose, and those who lose will save it. And they rebel against the clearest evidence of truth presented to a human being. And so because of this rebellion, the host of the saints and the daily were given over to it. He prospered, the horn, Satan, in everything he did, and true was cast to the ground. Now, this will happen at the sixth trumpet, right before the seventh trumpet, Revelation 10, 7. Because um, remember, the corporate service is abolished when the censor is cast down, Revelation 8, 5. Remember that, right? So there's only one more service left, one more daily, and that's the individual daily. Okay, and because of the rebellion, <clears throat> notice how this takes place. This happens this way. Lucifer forces everyone to receive a karagma, the mark of the beast. Upon receiving the mark of the beast, you're good with the government. Then now you're able to buy, sell, trade, feed your kids. But you know what? The Holy Spirit is speaking to you so clearly at that time. 
doing everything short of violating man's will. And then what happens is they reject the clearest evidence of truth. They commit the unpardonable sin and therefore they're already to, there's, there's beyond, put, they place them beyond forgiveness. Then we have a uh, placing themselves beyond redemption. And then, so at the end, the world will be uh, divided or polarized into true groups. Those that are sealed and the carnal nature is removed and those that are marked, committed, those that commit the unpardonable sin upon receiving the mark of the beast. So because Satan infor- forces everyone to receive the mark and God's people are already sealed, he brings the daily to a closing. Does that make sense? It's crazy. I mean, Jesus, he hung in there all the way until there's no more, you know, it's amazing. It's just touching to hear that, that he would hang in there all the way. And, but the people made the choice to reject the evidence of truth. And uh, anyways, so before the seven trumpets sounds, all cases have been decided. Therefore, a daily service will be obsolete or unnecessary. All right. Whew. What, what is going to, if, if everybody's Sabbath is going to be, and God is going to be wiped off, what's going to make anybody want to follow after the devil? Okay, is could you please repeat that again? To survive? Oh, repeat that again. So, if, if the devil is um, casting down every single Sabbath of every, in other words, what you're saying is they're making everybody unhappy with their or having to choose yes. against their religion. Yes. So if nobody's happy, then yes. their religion and their God is being obsolete. So Correct. Making them follow. Okay, up. wonderful question. Why? Yeah, why would people follow Satan if he goes against all their religion? Well, put it this way, if a, a 16 feet being comes out from the sky with 200 million angels and, and make signs and wonders and, and, and make fire come down from heaven and he say, I am God and he, he makes fire come down from heaven and kill a few thousand people right in front of your eyes, what would you say to someone like that? I mean, if God now dwells on earth, what, what need is there for diversity? What need is there for Muslims, for Christians, for Hindus, for Sikh, for all these other religions? We're watching Almighty God right before us. And He's here. I mean, I'll tell you how to worship. You don't need to worry about your gods. And then He's going to say something like, You guys called me all different names, but all roads roads lead to Rome, right? (laughs) Isn't that what they say? (laughs) It's all the same. You know, you called me this name, but I'm, I'm the one who you've been praying to the whole time. You know? So, that is why uh, it's going to be a big delusion. And these people have already believed. Because they have, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 2, I believe 9 and 10. It says, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. God gave them over to a strong delusion and they believe the lie. So, because they refuse, and you cannot refuse something you're not offered. Yes. Well, as I understand, the 144,000 will have 190 days to preach their message before the message eclipses with the devil appearing. Because once he appears, not only would uh, um, it would be too great, I mean, if, if he was to allow to, uh, the destroyer to appear before, at the beginning of the tribulation, what chances would the 144,000 have? You see, not, not much. But uh, God, that's why God holds them back two-thirds of the way into the tribulation. Remember that 11 and 35 is divisive in three, four forty-fives, And then God destroys, not only God destroys one-third 12 times, but He spares the world of two-thirds. I'm not allowing the world to be destroyed. To show that he's a generous king. So he, uh, he also um, spares the world of two-thirds of the time into the tr- time of trouble. Does that make sense? I think Dara's question is what will they say? Well, they will be giving the three, the four angels message. When the asteroids hit, it'll be 
birth and Oh, okay. She's asking what Okay, so yes. At the point in time when people struggle with the destruction of a certain thing, they will proclaim their first message yes. and worship the God, the Creator, yes. of heaven and earth. When the second aspect, then it's the second angel, they will reveal the truth as it right. happens. But they're talking about a God. Yeah. And then we're seeing a God. We're yes. thinking we're seeing a God who's not God. They will so be will they be this sealed is a God before? Well, but remember... Some people will be sealed before. Some people will be sealed later. Um, when the devil appears, uh, it's not going to be a surprise to the people of God. The Bible, Revelation 17, 8. Only those that had not been written in the book of life will be astonished. So, what, I guess what you were asking, thank you for that clarification, is that you know, for the, the, the four angels' messages, they are, they are not a message that are being preached right now. They are timely. They are punctiliar, as they say. You know, in other words, it's a time in the future. That, for example, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Okay, that's when the sixth trumpet is starting. Should I pray right now that I should die? No, that's a punctiliar message. So, for example, the, the first angel's message is, Worship him who made the heaven, the, 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 the heaven, the earth, and the springs of water. The very things, the very elements in nature that the first four trumpets will destroy. So they will warn the world, okay, calamity is coming. But you know what? You need to worship the God who is going to do this. Because God will do nothing unless he reveals through his servants the prophets, remember? So he sends 144,000 to warn them of this destruction. So they're going to be fully aware. And then the second message is Babylon, Babylon is fallen. In other words, this, this movement that fallen means corrupt in nature. Even though it looks good from the outside, like a fallen angel, but it's corrupt on the inside. The intentions, the motives are wrong. So the angels, the, the 144,000 will give the warning and say, this is a corrupt movement. Breathed and, and orchestrated by Satan himself, do not join it. Even though it appears to be the solution to solve man's problem. So the message is very timely. Then when the devil appears, the third angel's message, he says, Will not worship the beast if any man worships the beast. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is pour out full strength to the cup of indignation, and he shall not rest day or night. You know the whole thing. So that is a very timely message. Okay, and then right before the trump, the sixth trumpet, uh, right uh, before the seventh trumpet sounds, the fourth angel message says, "Come out of her, my people! The, the mercy is about to close. And this is the last call. <laughs> Come out now, or you stay in it forever." You see, those messages are not to be blown right now. You know, even though we've been proclaiming, you know, "Come out of Catholicism, Protestantism." You know, that's Babylon, but that's that's a very narrow uh, view uh, because the world, God cares for 100% of the world, not just 25%. 25% of the world are Christians. You see, 75% uh, either does not accept or does not know Jesus Christ as Lord. So the message of revelation, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ to the whole world, not just to Christians. Does that answer? Yes. And I made the point last week that at the sixth seal, um, the, uh, you know how the, when the blood of, uh, the Bible says that the blood of Abel was crying to you when his brother was, you know, yeah, when Cain killed Abel, the Bible says the blood was crying out to God, right? But of course, that's an analogous, you know, the blood doesn't talk, but the witness of the blood was speaking and bothering God. In that same sense, the blood of the martyrs in the sixth seal, in the fifth seal, is crying out to God. It says, How long, oh God, are you going to allow this to go on? And then the voice comes and says, We need to let these things happen, I'm paraphrasing, until the full number of those, you know, are killed, until as they had been killed, Revelation 6. Um, so, until the full number allowed, which is the one third, that God allows at the sixth trumpet. So, so that, that's why I made the point last week that a lot of us here are dead men walking. Just like Jesus. Jesus, when He came to earth, He was a dead man. That's why He already knew He was going to have to die. 
you know, it was already prophesied. And that's why the Bible says, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on, not blessed are the living. If you're dead already, <laughs> you see? Yes, sir. Okay. He exalted himself in the heaven with the argument that Jesus is not just. Yes. And I think he convinced one third of the angels with this message. Yes. The chances are to, the, to conclude that he is going to use the same technique in, in earth, saying that the Jesus Christ is not just, the salvation is not possible, mm -hmm. and uh, doing the lack of a global mobility, Said, yeah. We can the, the doctor that he can use in each part of the world any convincing argument to that specific population to not follow Jesus. Yes. That means uh, will not be a global uh, message. uniform message for okay. each nation. Probably he is going to use the one different technique. Yes. Absolutely. And, and people will be uh, deceived. Yes. Is, since you said 25% of the world is, are Christians, uh, for the Christians, who I think will be the most difficult uh, uh, way to convince them. But for the other 75% that not know Jesus, it will be very easy for them to follow the devil, yes. uh, exaltation, because they are going to see the only evidence to be besides what they believe in my tradition or no evidence itself. Right. As a Christians, we have the evidence of Jesus Christ. That's more difficult us to visualize. Well, I cannot deny Jesus because of this. Yes. And in my opinion, uh, uh, he is going to use uh, a specific uh, mm. arguments for with different uh, cultures and religions. To it will not be a global argument. This, yes. <coughs> this destroys the idea that it would be a universal law to worship one specific. This, uh, for, uh, this, uh, based on this, I have a question. Yes. Uh, in the heaven, one third of the angels mm -hmm. was deceived. Yes. I heard that one pastor one time saying that the number of uh, saved the people in earth is too to supply, replenish the one third. Replenish this one third of the angels. Well, what's the number of angels? Is one third of millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of angels. Billions, yes. Which number is this? Yes. My question is: Is in the Bible any justification or any passage that supports this idea that the number of the saved people is to to complete the original number of okay. angels in the heaven? All right. Well, it will be higher number or lower yes. number. Right. That's my let, let me say first, I thank you so much for that point. And, and the, uh, uh, addressing what you said first, I do, uh, that's why I said that uh, he's going to say to the Muslim one thing and to the Sikh another thing, because he's the master of the seed, you know, so he could very well work in the way he will work the best. Now, as far as that argument, I... I uh, it is, there are very good, um, the Bible does not teach this, okay, but it indicates a possibility that this may be the reason, because he waits for the full 7,000 year, 7, years. Why did he wait 7,000 years? Why not 6,000? Why not 8? It appears to me that he is waiting for that amount for a specific harvest, a specific reason. And I, so that could be a very strong argument, and many others that I'm not able to bring out right now. Uh, but that is a, it's a speculative. It's definitely not a, something that we can say for sure. Uh, only time will tell uh, if that helps. <laughs> well, if we don't have any more questions, let us bow our heads. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful study that we had. Lord, we ask that you give us the faith of Jesus. Help us to continue to believe in your word. Above all things, it is your, our prayer in your holy name. Amen. <laughs>